Good morning and welcome to Connection Class 301. Uh, this is a bit of a first for me because of the coronavirus. I've never done a podcast before. Uh, so this morning, this morning in uh, Connection Classes, we're going to take a look at Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. A couple of things you're going to need is a uh, your Bible, something to write on, and a pencil or pen, and uh, you might want to get a uh, cup of coffee, and uh, you can pause this at any time, uh, write down some notes or something that you're thinking about. So with that being said, let's take a look at Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. I'm going to be looking at my computer screen off to my left, probably your right, so uh, let's read that together, okay? Romans chapter 3, verses 21 through 31. But now, apart from the law, God's righteousness has been revealed, attested by the law and the prophets. That is, God's righteousness through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe, since there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are justified freely by his grace to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. God presented him as a propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. He presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at this present time so that he would be righteous and declared righteous, the one who has faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It excluded, is it excluded by what, by that, by what kind of law? By one of works? No, on the contrary, by law of faith. For we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from works of law. Or is God for Jews only? Is he not also for the Gentiles? Yes, for Gentiles too. Since there is one God who who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith, do we then cancel the law through faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. A couple of things I want to ask you as we get started here. Have you ever wanted to be right? Uh, If you're like me, there's many times that as you're in a discussion or if you're playing a game, um, anything from Scrabble to uh, uh, any type of game uh, or any discussion, you want to be right. Uh, you know the right answer. Maybe you're playing privy, trivia's pursuit. Uh, you like to be in the right place. Uh, you like to be there at the right time. Uh, you want to have the right job, make the right decision. Uh, many of us need the right perspective on things, particularly right now with the virus going around. Uh, and then if we were, when we were growing up, we wanted... Our parents wanted us to have the right attitude. Uh, The bottom line is, the truth is, uh, we like being right. Uh, But the problem is, is that we're not right with God because of our sin. And we're going to look at some of that today. Um, Again, have you ever argued with someone and you, uh, sometimes you'll, you'll just, argue, even if you know you're not right, you're just trying to make that point. Uh, Unfortunately, we can't do that with God because he knows the right answers. So with that being said, what does it mean to be right with God? Well, there's a couple of things we're going to look at, three areas. Uh, What does it mean to to be right with God? How do we get there? And what are the results of being right with God? Is being right uh, the same thing as being having God's righteousness. Um, you know, it's difficult for us to understand God's righteousness uh, because we're sinners, and everything we do is tainted by sin. Uh, Romans chapter three twenty three just told us that we're all sinners, and then Romans three ten uh, through twelve says this: as it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. Together, they have become useless. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. Uh, 
the Bible very clearly tells us that we're not right, that even our motives aren't right. And the things that we even do that help others, if they're done with sinful attitude and self-serving, they're not right. And only God can give us that. So what we like to do is contrast contrast ourselves against others, not God. And when we do that against others, it makes us feel better. Uh, what, what God does is compare us to himself because God is righteous. As we just read, none of us do good. None of us even really attempt to do good because of selfish motives. Motives. Uh, try as we want to, we still fall short of God's standard. We like to demonstrate what is right, and uh, or we like to determine what is right and wrong. We make up our own right and our own wrong. We see that today. We see what's going on in our world. We see what's going on in our country, and people are making the decisions themselves as to what is right and wrong. God has already given us that through his word. Um, we set our own standards. We even change those when we don't feel like they're meeting our standards. We move the uh, yard marker, so to speak. There's not a consistency. However, God's very character is the standard of what is right. We are to compare ourselves against his person or his character. And unfortunately, we fall very, very short. So the definition of righteousness is God himself. God is the definition of righteousness because he can do no wrong. Everything he does is right. Uh, everything he thinks, everything that he says, by his very nature or character is right. Uh, Dr. Jerry Bynes makes uh, the definition for righteousness as follows. He writes, God's righteousness is unobtainable by obedience to any law or by any merit of man's own or any other condition that is other than faith in Christ. The man who trusts in Christ becomes the righteousness of God himself. So the first thing I want us to look at is this. Uh, I want us to see here that the law that Paul is talking about here only shows us that we cannot be righteous on our own. No one can keep the law in its entirety. Even if we could keep the law, uh, we would then have obtained salvation on our own merit. And we just read that that's not possible because we're not possible of doing good. Paul writes in Romans 3.20, For no flesh will be justified in his sight by the works of the law, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So the law is actually there to show us that we fall short, that we're not capable of doing it. Uh, I know over the years I've asked people different things about, hey, how, how will you get into heaven? What is it that you think God wants from you? Uh, uh, if you were to stand before God, what would you say to him? And and perhaps you've said the same thing to people. So uh, some of the answers I've gotten is, you know, I'm a good person. Uh, I help others. Uh, I'm kind. Never killed anybody. I give to those who are in need. I sacrifice. You know, all of these things are noble and should count in the person's favor. Uh, for some reason, we think these are things that God wants from us. And in reality, uh, they're not. That's not something God wants for us. God doesn't want, he, he wants us to be kind, but not for the sake of selfishness. We, he wants us to work through him and his spirit. Uh, let's take a look real quick at verse 22 and following, okay? Uh so it begins with, that is God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe since there is no distinction. Now, I really like this. What a wonderful statement when it says uh, the word all, uh, anyone, uh, everyone who trusts or believes in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, God will uh, 
make righteous as we place our faith in Jesus and his work. So it tells us here that God makes no distinctions. He sees all of us equally. And unfortunately, that equalness is as sinners. We're, we're sinners. And God sees each and every one of us as a sinner. But he doesn't leave us there. He has made the opportunity for us to come to the saving understanding in Jesus. So uh, God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe since God doesn't make a distinction because he sees all of us as a sinner. God's righteousness is not obtained through faith. Our God's righteousness is only attained through faith in Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross. When we place our faith in Jesus, God's righteousness is imparted to us. God declares us righteous, not on our works, but because of the work and character of Jesus. It's not us. What a wonderful, wonderful uh, way God has done that. We place it, when we do it ourselves, we brag and we boast and we think we're better than others, but God sees us all the same. Verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Listen, we're all guilty of not living up to God's standard. There's not one of us that was able to or is able to meet the standard that God said, and that standard is himself. Uh, not even, it's not even what we do, it's what we are. We are sinners. We are sinners by nature, just as God's nature is is righteous, our nature is sinful. Uh, verse 24 here, uh, they are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. Uh, by his grace, God has made us innocent at no cost to us. Uh, he has done it freely through the redemptive act of Christ on the cross. God has say, uh, said that the ransom is paid in full for your sin because of Jesus' death. That is good news. That is hope. God has made it possible for us to enter into a saving relationship with him because of the work of Jesus. Verse 25, God presented him, Jesus, as a propitiation through faith in his blood to demonstrate his righteousness because in his restraint, God passed over the sins previously committed. Here we see that Jesus has become our covering, just as uh, with the Ark of the Covenant, there was the, uh, the mercy seat. Jesus is the covering, just as the mercy seat, where the blood was placed on the mercy seat. Uh, Jesus' blood is placed over us to protect us. When God looks at our sin, he sees Jesus. Our faith in Christ not only makes us right with God, but our sins are gone. The whole idea is that God passes over our sin. He doesn't wink at it or ignore it. He chooses to forget them. Verse 26 here. He presented him to demonstrate his righteousness at this present time so that he would be righteous and declare righteous the one who has faith in Jesus. Uh, John MacArthur writes in his commentary, from the beginning, God has demonstrated his eternal power and divine nature for all men. In Romans 1.20, uh, we'll look that up at a later time. Uh, through the incarnation, death, and resurrection of Christ, God gave man the ultimate revelation of himself. <coughs> Let me get a drink real quick. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, God gave mankind the ultimate revelation of himself, the ultimate demonstration of of his righteousness at this present time. What an incredible statement. Let me read that again. From the beginning, God had demonstrated his eternal power and divine nature for all men to see through the incarnation, 
death, and resurrection of Christ. God gave mankind the ultimate revelation of himself, the ultimate demonstration of his righteousness at this present time. Verse 27, where then is their boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By one of works? No, on the contrary, by the law of faith. There is nowhere else to boast but in the Lord. He is the one who is the author of our faith. You know, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 21, it says this, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. God is the author of our salvation. He is the one that did it. We saw earlier that we're incapable of doing those things. We're incapable of doing good. We're incapable of making things right. Even when we do our very best, we fall short. Well, Jesus is the author and perfecter of our faith. Verse 28, for we concluded that man is justified by faith from apart from the works of the law. Uh, you know, God has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. Even the worst sinner has the opportunity to receive God's forgiveness because we don't have to keep a set of rules to make God love us. God loves us, so he made it possible. You know, growing up as children, we were given responsibilities and rules and things that we needed to do, but uh, sometimes we didn't. Hey, Kevin, did you take out the trash? Oh, I forgot. Uh, my parents would remind me and sometimes I'd have to pay that consequence when I failed to do that. Uh, I fell short of my responsibilities. My parents didn't do it for me. They made me do it because I was capable of doing it. I'm not capable. You're not capable of bringing salvation to yourself or even becoming righteous or in a right relationship with God. Um, Galatians tells us this, uh, chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Yet we know that no one is justified by works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And we believe in Jesus Christ so that we might be justified by faith in Christ, not by works of the law, because by the works of the law, no man being no human being will be justified. We can't do it ourselves. Paul tells us that. And then one that we're all familiar with, uh, Ephesians 2, 8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and there's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. We cannot boast in, uh, in our own efforts. It's because it's not our efforts. It's his. Uh, verse 29. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he? No, he is also the God of the Gentiles. Yes, for the Gentiles too. Verse 30. Since there is one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. You know, here Paul lets his readers know that God has not limited his love to the Jews only. I don't know about you, but for me, being a Gentile, I am very thankful that God loves me and has not limited his love only to the Jews uh, and the entire world. Uh, so there are Jews and Gentiles, and uh, I fall into the category of Gentile. God loves his creation and wants a relationship with us, and so he made that possible. Have you ever gotten something that you know was valuable? Um, you know, over the years, we we all have. Perhaps you got a car, and so you're real protective of it. Uh, you wash it every week. You vacuum it out. You uh, took your shoes off to ride around in it. Uh, you parked at the other end of the parking lot. Uh, you put cones up around it to... Uh, in public parking areas to keep people from banging it with their car doors. 
uh, ladies, maybe you've gotten a piece of jewelry or there's a family heirloom that you have passed down over the years or had passed down over the years uh, or, or, or some other object, um, a vase. I, I think of something that's very fragile. Um, and, and what we want to do is we want to protect that. And at the same time, we want others to, to know we've got it and it is something that is valuable. But then we're concerned that what if they want it as well? You know, in our current situation uh, with the coronavirus, there are people that are uh, hoarding things like uh, toilet paper and hand wipes and sanitizers. And uh, we try to, uh, we, we want people to know we got them, but at the same time, what if they have a crisis in, of their own and they break into our home or our storage area and take those things from us? You say, what does that have to do with God being the God of Jews only? Well, think about the Jewish people. They had something extremely, extremely valuable, and that was a relationship with God. Uh, it makes me think about uh, Jonah. If you remember, Jonah was, uh, uh, he did not want to go to Nineveh. It wasn't because he was afraid. It's because he did not want God to to forgive them. Jonah was actually running and fleeing from God and ended up in the belly of the fish because of his selfishness, not because of his fear. In fact, he wanted to die. He wasn't uh, concerned about that. And so even in his attempt to uh, take his own life, when he asked the other sailors to throw him overboard, uh, God saved him and still accomplished what he wanted. Uh, look at Jonah chapter 4, 1 through 2. Uh, but Jonah was greatly displeased and became furious. He prayed to the Lord, Please, Lord, isn't this what I said while I was still in my own country? So he, he's had this conversation with God. Look at what he said. That's why I fled toward Tarshish in the first place. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God slow to become angry, rich in faithful love, and one who relents from sending disaster. Jonah knew that God was merciful. The Jews knew that God is merciful, that he forgives sin. That And the very verse, the very thing that um, Paul is saying here is God the God of the Jews only. Uh, it's a rhetorical question. The reader knew, no, if there's only one God, he's got to be the God of everyone. And so uh, Gentiles are in need of God's love and salvation in need of his righteousness. You know, isn't it wonderful that God loves all his people? Uh, we tend to do the same thing that the Jews did by keeping God to ourselves. Uh, you know, the truth is God doesn't belong to the Jews any more than he belongs to us. We belong to him. We should be eager to tell others and share that good news of his righteousness and his forgiveness with them. Verse 31 tells us, uh, Paul writes here, do we then cancel the law because of faith? Absolutely not. On the contrary, we uphold the law. You know, we confirm the law because the law, as we've already seen, uh, showed us our need. And God's law was never intended to bring salvation. Uh, it only showed that man was unable to meet God's standard, unable to meet God's righteousness. Man cannot be righteous on his own. Paul reminds us that uh, a saving relationship with God does not happen because we do the right thing. Uh, it's because God uh, accepts us through faith in Jesus Christ and then imparts his character onto us because of our faith and the work of what Jesus did on the cross. God acts first. Uh, the law is not to be ignored, but it is to be confirmed. 
we do have to uh, remember that uh, the law was there to show us that we needed a Savior. Today, we don't have to keep the law because it was never intended to save us. Uh, nor are we to abolish the law because, again, it is to remind us that we needed a Savior. That After all that we did, you might remember the uh, uh, rich young ruler when he was asked, he asked Jesus, what do I need to inherit the kingdom of heaven? And he told him, hey, uh, you need to keep all the laws and commandments of Moses. He said, I've done that. And then Jesus told him, then go sell everything that you have and come and follow me. And he didn't do that. <laughs> Truth was, he had not kept all of the laws of Moses. So what does it mean to be righteous? It means to be in a right relationship with God. God because of his work on the cross and he imparts his own character and rightness onto us. When he looks at us, he doesn't see our sin. He sees the work of Christ, the covering. How do we get there? Only God can make that happen. Only God can cover our sin. We cannot pay for our own sin. God paid for it and he did what we were incapable of doing. What are the results of being right with God? Well, there are certainly many, but the main, main reason is to bring us back into a right relationship with our Creator. It's to make us right with God so that we can fellowship constantly with Him. God loves us and wants good things for us. He wants to bring us back into his loving relationship and to give us good things. Um, hey, thanks for being with us this morning. Uh, first podcast, a uh, little awkward, I know, but uh, appreciate your time. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll get a little bit better and be able to uh, share with you some more of the truths of what God has done for us. Thank you, and I'm looking forward to our upcoming service. I hope you'll tune into that as well. Hey, have a blessed day, and uh, looking forward to seeing you soon.